Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome. This is going to be our first session. So, in this we will be doing introduction to optimization. Uh, we will follow this up with uh, linear and non-linear regression, right. So, in this we will be basically doing that given a set of data points and a model, how do we find out the model coefficients, right. Then we will be discussing this uh, 5 meta heuristic techniques, teaching learning based optimization, particle swarm optimization, differential evolution, genetic algorithm and artificial B colony optimization, right. So, in genetic algorithm we will be discussing both binary and real coded GA. So, we will not only be discussing this meta heuristic techniques, we will also implement them in MATLAB, right. So, we will be using MATLAB, uh, once you understand the techniques you are free to implement it on whichever programming language you are comfortable with. So, the assignments and quiz will not uh, involve any coding. Uh, exercise, right. So, it is not necessary for you to know MATLAB or learn MATLAB uh, to be able to do the assignments or uh, give the exam, but we will be doing um, considerable portion of this course in MATLAB, right and we will also introduce you to couple of other softwares which we will look into. Right? So, we will also be looking at constraint handling. So, initially when we discuss this problems, we will be uh, initially when we discuss this uh, meta heuristic techniques, we will be looking at only at unconstrained problems, unconstrained and un and bounded problems, right. So, we will assume that there are no constraints and then we will discuss these uh, techniques. Then we will let you, uh, then uh, we will discuss how do we handle constraints in, in, such, in this meta heuristic techniques, if the problem has constraints, how do we uh, handle, the, handle the constraints using this meta heuristic techniques. So, broadly we will be looking into penalty based and correction approaches, right. So, once you know penalty based constraint handling or correction approach for constraint handling, you can use that with all of these 5 techniques. Uh, to solve any constraint optimization problem, right. We will also be looking at uh, two mathematical programming techniques, linear programming and mixed integer linear programming, right. So, we are also bringing this mathematical programming techniques uh, into this, so that you can actually uh, also understand the limitations of meta heuristic techniques, right. So, given an optimization problem, there are multiple ways to solve it, right. So, we should be in a position to select the best possible uh, set of techniques that can help us to solve the problem. Then we will be looking at a production planning case study, right. So, in this we will take one problem and we will model it as a MILP, right. We will model and solve it as an MILP. Also, we will model and solve it using meta heuristic techniques. So, the reason for doing this is you will be able to understand the strength and weakness of both mathematical programming techniques and meta heuristic techniques, right. So, we will take a problem which you can consider it to be a real life optimization problem and then we show uh, how do we solve it with both mathematical programming as well as meta heuristic techniques, so that you can understand the strength and weakness of both of them. As part of this course, we will be introducing you to three different uh, state of the optimization solvers, right. One is um, optimization toolbox of MATLAB, uh, we will be looking at IBM iLog uh, Simplex optimization studio, we will be looking at gender, general algebraic modeling system GAMS, right and we will also look at uh, NEOS optimization solver, right. So, both of this we will be using together, right. So, optimization toolbox of MATLAB. It has inbuilt mathematical programming techniques for linear programming, non-linear programming and mixed integer linear programming. It has inbuilt meta heuristic techniques which can solve non-linear programming for which mathematical programming techniques are also available and it can solve certain versions of mixed integer non-linear programming. Also we will be using MATLAB, right, for implementing the meta heuristic techniques that we will discuss. Uh, IBM iLog Simplex optimization, the full version is available as part of IBM academic initiative, 
right. So, non academic users can use either the demo or evaluation version, right. So, IBM iLog Simplex Optimization Studio can be used for solving linear programming, mixed integer linear programming, quadratic programming and mixed integer quadratic programming, mixed integer quadratic constraint program constrained programming as well as constrained programming. Right. So, you can go to this link and uh, you will have to register right? and then you will be able to freely download uh, that software. Okay. So, GAMS is primarily a modeling language, right? so wherein you merely state what is the problem right? and then there are a set of solvers which can be used to solve it. Right? So, the solvers which come with the free uh, with the uh, demo version of GAMS uh, is limited, right? like it cannot solve problems of very large dimension. So, what we will do is, uh, we will code the problem in GAMS right? and then we have this new solver which can accept the GAMS files uh, right? and then it can solve the problem for us. Once the problem is solved, we will be getting the results, uh, we can get the results over email or it will even be displayed on your browser wherein you submit the prob when you submit the problem right so gams can be used for linear programming mixed integer linear programming non linear programming and mixed integer non linear programming right uh, and this neos optimization solver we will be using it only for gams but if you go and have a look at uh, this website neosserver.org you will see that it accepts input from a wide range of modeling platforms not only from GAMS. Right? So, the reason for uh, taking three different solvers and not restricting to one solver is each of the solver has their own limitation. Right? So, for example, optimization toolbox of MATLAB cannot solve uh, mixed integer nonlinear programming when equality constraints are involved. Right? So, when equality constraints are involved, it does not support integer variables. There is no function. Uh, as of now that is in 2019 which can solve a uh, proper MINLP problem. The good thing about uh, MATLAB is uh, programming is much easier in MATLAB, right? so that is why we are going to use it to code the meta heuristic techniques in MATLAB. Uh, this IBM iLog uh, Simplex Optimization Studio again cannot solve MINLP problems, right? uh, a generic MINLP problem it cannot solve. Uh, but the good thing about this particular software is its full version is available as part of IBM academic initiative plus this constraint programming is available which is not there in MATLAB. Right? Similarly, the good thing about GAMS is no matter what is the problem size, we will be able to uh, use it to model it and we can solve it using the freely available NEOS optimization solver. So, this can solve MINLP also. Right? The drawback of GAMS is that the demo version does not solve bigger larger problems. So, we will overcome that limitation with this uh, NEOS optimization solver. Right? So, each of the software has their own uh, set of benefits and drawbacks. Right? So, we are looking into uh, the best possible set of tools so that we can solve most of the optimization problems uh, that are encountered in real life. In this session, we will be looking into uh, what are the components of an optimization problem uh, and also how do we classify optimization problems and also into how we classify optimization techniques. Some of the common applications of uh, optimization are timetabling. Right? So, for example, uh, our timetabling uh, wherein we need to schedule uh, the classes, right? we need to decide which course would be taught in uh, which class at what time. Right. So, that is a classical apl application of timetabling. Another common application is site selection. Right. So, if you want to establish an industry, you, you have lot of options right, to establish the industry. So, you need to decide where you want to establish the industry. So, depending upon the industry, a large number of factors will uh, play a role into how we decide uh, the optimal location of an industry. Optimization is also widely used in production planning, controlling and scheduling. It is used in tariff design and these are some uh, engineering applications of optimization. Uh, you can also look into uh, various other applications. right? So, if you go to this website, this is a GAMS website. right? So, this is one of the software that we will be learning as part of this course. right? So, it has a collection of problems right depending upon the subject you can look into the problems depending upon the subject so right here if we see it has been used in macroeconomics 
management science and or finance uh, stochastic programming microeconomics chemical engineering right so this is just a, a very small subset of uh, problems which we are showing over here right so if you go into this go, if you go to this website you will be able to see a large collection of problems and you will be able to see that it is used in uh, various uh, areas right so all these files are freely available so you can even sort them as per the uh, type of problem right and this briefly describes what is the problem so these are some commercial success story reported by mathworks so mathworks is the company which owns matlab right so here we have shown uh, four uh, commercial applications if you are interested you can go and have a look at uh, the individual story and see how uh, it has been applied uh, in that particular industry these are some of the applications from uh, ibm here we are only here we are restricting ourselves with uh, the success stories of the three softwares which we are going to study but optimization has been used in many commercial applications apart from this so you can also get some uh, resources from this google or tools so google has this uh, web page right so wherein they have given lot of or tools which are freely av available in the last 3 to 4 slides we just showed you the commercial applications right uh, where the tools which we are going to discuss as part of this course have been used so now let us look into some of the interesting optimization problems that are widely uh, stated right so this traveling salesman problem a traveling person has to uh, tour n cities so in this case so for example let us consider this case wherein there are uh, e cities so there are five cities city a b c d e right and there is a cost associated with each city so if we travel from city a to city b the cost is 5 if we travel from city a to city e the cost is 2 if we travel from city a to city d the cost is 3 so if we travel from city e to city d the cost is let's say 1 this is let's say 4 this is let's say 8 and this is let's say 9 and this let's say it is 2 right so this is the cost of traveling in between two cities so uh, the task is the traveling salesman has to visit all the cities right and come back to the city that started with and each city is to be visited exactly once so one one of the solution can be from city a to city b city b to city e city e to city c and city c to city d and return back to city a we know the cost associated with each uh, tour so a to b we know the cost is 5 b to e uh, b to e the cost is 4 e to c e to c the cost is 2 c to d c to d the cost is 9 d to a right d to a the cost is 3 right so the total cost is the summation of all this right similarly another tour can be instead of this person going to city b let us say he decides to go to city d right and then to city e then to city c then to city b and then he comes back to city a so again there is a cost associated with each of this right so again we can calculate what is the total cost right so there is a different cost over here there is a different cost over here so depending upon the route uh, the person takes the cost is going to be different so the task here is to find out this path that which path is to be chosen such that the total cost required to tour all the cities without repeating uh, any of them and again come back to the original starting point uh, the, that cost has to be minimum so this is a classical problem uh, it is known as traveling salesman problem right? so there are various ways to solve this traveling salesman problem right? so another problem is na what is called as knapsack problem so in this knapsack problem we have a hiker right, who wants to fill uh, the knapsack to a maximum value so let us say there are 10 items each item is associated with a weight and it has a cost right so I have 10 items I in the I denotes the index w1 w2 all the way up to w10 and then we have c1 c2 all the way up to c10 so c indicates the cost right so now the person wants to fill as many items as possible in the bag right and there is a weight constraint that the total weight of the knapsack has to be less than a given value right and for whatever value whatever item he he or she chooses to place uh, in the knapsack uh, we can calculate the total value that he is carrying let us say 
the uh, we have C1 is equal to 10, C2 is equal to 5, C3 is equal to 4, C4 is equal to 8. Let us say he decides to carry just C1 and C4. So, the value that he is carrying is only 18, 10 plus 8, 18 and corresponding to the first item there is also going to be a weight and for the fourth item there is going to be a weight. So, the weight that he is carrying going to carry is W1 plus W4, right. So, that total weight has to be less than what is prescribed, right. So, now the task is which of the items can be chosen so that the weight constraint is respected as well as the person is able to carry the maximum value with himself or herself. So, that is known as knapsack problem. Both traveling salesman and knapsack problem are optimization problem. There is something called as feasibility problem. So, in feasibility problem, we do not have an objective that has to be minimized or maximized, right. But we have a set of constraints that need to be satisfied, right. So, map coloring is one such uh, classical problem. So, here there are six countries, right. As shown over here, there are six countries, Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, Denmark and France. So, the task is to color each country such that no two countries which are neighbors are colored with the same color. Right. So, we have four sets of color, blue, white, yellow, green. So, each of the six cities is to be colored by one of these four colors. Right. And the constraint is that no pair of neighboring countries should have the same color. Right. So, here uh, if you see there is no uh, objective which has to be minimized or maximized, but we have a set of constraints that have to be satisfied. So, the color of uh, Denmark and Germany cannot be the same because they are neighboring. The color of Germany, Netherlands or Germany, Belgium, Germany, Luxembourg cannot be same as they have, they are neighbors, right. Similarly, Netherlands cannot have the same color as Belgium, Germany or Denmark, right. So, this is a feasibility problem. So, here we need to find the set of decision variables. As long as it satisfies the constraints which are given, it is sufficient. There is no objective which is to be maximized or minimized. So, feasibility problems are a subset of optimization problem. So, if we solve an optimization problem, the solution that which we get will be feasible, right. But the reverse is not true. The solution of a feasibility problem will be feasible for an optimization problem, but it need not be the best solution. Another classical uh, feasibility problem is Sudoku problem. Many of you would have solved the Sudoku problem. So, in the Sudoku problem, we have 81 squares, there are 9 rows and 9 columns right, 1 to 9 rows and 1 to 9 columns. So, there are a total of 80, 81 cells, right. So, each cell is to be uh, filled with uh, integers from 1 to 9, right. Remember 0 is not allowed, right. So, each row has to be filled with numbers, any number from 1 to 9 such that no two, no, no two numbers in the same column or no two numbers in the same row are identical. Right. So, for example, this is already filled with 9. So, I cannot use 9 to fill any other uh, empty cell in row 1. Right. Similarly, uh, this column if we see uh, this particular column, it already has a 6 and 1. So, the rest of the cells which we have over here can take any value from 1 to 9 except 1 and 6. Right. So, that is the constraint that no two values uh, in any row should be identical and no two values in any column should be identical, right. And there are these 9 squares. So, here if you see this is the first square, second square, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth and ninth, right. So, each of the square is going to have 9 cells and the values in the 9, in these 9 cells need to be unique. So, for example, this cell if you see, right. So, there are 9 cells and uh, we have already used 3, 6, 9, 7, right. So, the remaining values are 1, 2, 4, 5, 8, right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 is already there, 8, 9. So, these 5 boxes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 have to be filled with these values. Again, the row and column constraints need to be respected, right. So, for example, 2 we cannot fill this box with 2 because 2 is already there in that row, right. So, this is Sudoku problem. There is no objective as such over here, there are only constraints. So, a Sudoku problem can have uh, more than one solution, right. So, for example, for this problem, there are three solutions, right. So, all these three solutions are unique, 
right. So, consider these two solutions here it is 1 phi, here it is phi 1 and again here it is phi 1 and here it is 1 phi, right. So, these two solutions are unique solutions, right. Um, so, both of these solutions are equally good for this feasibility problem, right. Similarly, if we compare the solution 3, if we call this as solution 3 and if we call this as solution 2, right. So, here if we see this is also phi 1, this is also phi 1, this is also 1 phi, this is also 1 phi, right. But the change happens here. So, here it is 3 8, here it is 8 3 and this is 8 3 over here and this is 3 8 over here, right. So, all these 3 solutions S1, S2, S3 are feasible solutions for this Sudoku problem, right. However, any feasibility problem can be converted into an optimization problem, right. Right now, I can say that I want to fill this box, right, satisfying all the constraints which we discussed so far and we want this value to be maximum. Right. So, let us say if this box is represented since there are 81 cells, right, uh, let us say I this box is represented by 9 comma 9 or x 99. This is the name of a variable, right. So, if I denote the value filled, if I denote the cell as x 99, right, so it can take either a value of 1 over here as shown over here, phi as shown over here or phi as shown over here, right. Then this solution is not optimal, right, because we wanted to maximize this value, right, whereas these two solutions are equally good for this optimization problem. Remember first we discussed feasibility problem, feasibility problem we had to obey only the constraints, right. Uh, so, all the solutions, all the three solutions are equally good. Then we converted into an optimization problem, in optimization problem we said that all the, so all the constraints need to be satisfied. On top of that, we said that the last box, right, denoted by x99 should have the maximum possible value, right. Once we say that, then S1 is no longer the optimal solution because it has a value 1, whereas solution 2 and solution 3 have a value of 5. So, we would not prefer solution 1 if we had an objective maximize x99, okay, whereas solution 2 and solution 3 are equally good solution even for that optimization problem. So, that is the difference between a uh, feasibility problem and an optimization problem. Now, we just we just saw that this problem can be converted into an optimization problem, right. So, here what we have are two approaches, right. So, this is one approach 1 and this is approach 2. This is a mixed integer linear programming formulation, right. So, this is an optimization problem. Here we can either add uh, a objective function, right, that one of the variable has to be maximum or minimum or we can just say maximize phi, right. So, obviously this does not make sense because this is a scalar, it is going to be phi, but these are constraints, right. So, this problem can be mathematically formulated into a mixed integer linear programming problem. In fact, this is actually ILP, it is not even mixed integer linear programming, it is just integer linear programming because all the variables will take only uh, integer values, right. So, that is going to be one approach, right, wherein this whatever we discussed can be mathematically translated into these equations, right. So, that is the modeling part. Any optimization problem is going to have uh, first a modeling part right. Once we have the model, it is only then we apply any optimization techniques to solve. So, this is one approach wherein the Sudoku problem is converted into a, a integer linear programming and then solve. This is another approach, right, called as constraint programming. We will not be discussing constraint programming as part of uh, this course, right, uh, but we thought since it, this is an introduction lecture, we will at least let you know that there are other techniques also, right. So, CP stands for constraint programming and the Sudoku problem is much easier to model for constraint programming, right. So, you do not need to worry about how did these equations come as of now, right. When we are discussing uh, mixed integer linear programming, we will let you know how these equations were uh, arrived at, right. So, right now from this slide, you just need to understand that there are feasibility problems, there are optimization problem. Any feasibility problem can be converted into an optimization problem, right. So, if we know how to solve an optimization problem, we can solve feasibility problems, right. So, now let us formally look into 
the optimization in and its components. So, optimization uh, as you know uh, it is the selection of best choice, right. When we say best choice it has to be based on some criteria. If we are going to say select the best choice that invariably means that we have a set of alternatives from which we have to select the best choice, right. So, that decision is called as decision variables. So, we need to decide something. So, in optimization we will be calling it as a decision variable, right. Uh, objective function uh, is a relation of decision variables which is what we want to either uh, minimize or maximize or in general we say optimize and we have constraints uh, which are restrictions on the decision variable. So, broadly we have three components one is decision variables, other is objective function and the third one is constraint. So, constraints limit uh, what we can do, right. Um, objective function is what we want to maximize or minimize and decision variables are those which we can actually change, right. So, the point is that we need to find out the optimal value of the decision variables, right. So, one classical optimization problem that many of us might uh, have solved is uh, selecting the cheapest flight to travel from one city to another city, right. So, in that case the decision variable is to select a uh, flight, right. So, these are the decision variables, right. So, the decision variable as such is which flight to select. So, in this case if we see the minimum cost is 6355, right. So, that is the optimal decision with respect to minimizing the cost. So, the nature of the decision variable objective function and constraints uh, helps in the classification of problems and in many times uh, and at times uh, even it helps in the classification of uh, techniques. Right? So, let us look into each of the component uh, in a little bit more detail. The formulation of an optimization problem starts with identifying the decision variable. So, uh, because we need to know uh, what is that can be changed so as to improve the objective function. So, if you are not allowed to alter anything in that case there is uh, nothing to optimize. So, for example, if we tell that uh, x has to take a value of 2, right, then there is no choice that has to be made for x. But if it is said that x can take any value in the real domain, then we have a set of alternatives for from which we need to choose what is the best value for x, right. So, this decision variable uh, relates the objective function and constraints. So, the decision variables can be continuous. So, for example, here if x is the decision variable and if f of x is the objective function, right. So, x can take any value between 0 and 25. So, in that case x is continuous, the lower bound of x is 0 and the upper bound of x is 25. So, x is x, x can vary from 0 to 25. Our task is to find out the value of x for which something uh, the function is either minimum or maximum. At times the variable can be uh, discontinuous. So, for example, if let us say this is 5, this is 10, this is 20 and this is 30, right. So, in this case this variable x1 uh, can take any value between 5 to 10, right and can take any value between 20 to 30, but it cannot take a value which is greater than 10 right and it cannot take a value which is less than 20 right greater than 20, 10 and so x greater than 10 and x uh, less than 20 is not allowed right whereas x in between uh, 5 and 10 is permissible and x between 20 and 30 is uh, permissible right so between 10 and 20 there is a discontinuity so for integer variables uh, only the integer values are allowed. So, for example, 1 is allowed, 2 is allowed, uh, 3 is allowed for x1, 4 is allowed, 5 is allowed, uh, but 1.1 is not allowed or 2.8 is not allowed, right. Only the integers are allowed, right. So, in this case x1 can vary between 1 and 5, the only the integer values, right. So, the decision variable can be continuous, semi-continuous or it can be a integer or it can even be a set. So, for example, we need to decide which color is to be used to paint a country on the map, right. So, there we have options of uh, co colors, right. So, red, blue, green, yellow. So, the decision variable can be set also. In most real life problem, uh, the decision variables are bounded, but mathematically a decision variable can also be an unbounded variable. So, now that we have done a decision variable, let us move on to the objective function, right. So, the objective function is the criteria with respect to which the de decision variables are op to be optimized. So, our task is to determine the values of the decision variable so that a function known as objective function is either minimum or maximum, right. So, every point in the decision variable space. So, for example, if we have a two variable problem x1 and x2, right and let us say if this uh, portion is the feasible region, then every point in the feasible region has a 
particular scalar value called as objective function, right. So, for example, let us say f is equal to uh, x1 square plus 3x2. If this is our objective function, then for any va any value of x1 and x2, there is a unique value of f, right. So, a point in the search space, so x1 and x2 constitutes the search space because we are looking for the optimal values for x1 and x2 in its domain, right. So, every point over here uh, has a corresponding scalar value for its objective function. So, now if we are given two solutions, let us say this solution is over here, corresponds to over here and this solution corresponds to over here and let us say this is uh, 3 and this let us say this is 8, right. So, if the optimization problem is to maximize f, then this solution is better and if the optimization problem is to minimize f, then this solution is better, right. So, comp comparing two solutions is nothing but finding out the minimum of those two. Uh, objective function values. So, similar to decision variables, uh, the objective function can be continuous or semi-continuous. So, here we have an example of a continuous function, right. So, as x varies from uh, let us say point A to point B, f of x is continuous. Over here we have shown a, a discontinuous function that the objective function is defined from this particular x to this particular x, but there is no definition for the objective function in this region. Right. So, over here again it is defined in this region, but there is a discontinuity in between. So, the objective function can be continuous or uh, semi-continuous. So, for this course we will be most of the time we will be either talking about a minimization problem or a maximization problem. So, any minimization problem can be converted to a maximization problem or vice versa by multiplying the objective function with a uh, negative sign. So, for example, if the problem is to maximize f of x, the solution for this problem is the same as the solution for minimizing minus f of x, right. So, the value of the objective function might differ, but the value of the solution x would be the same. So, for example, you can look at this figure. So, this is the curve, the top curve is for uh, f of x, right, this curve is for f of x and the bottom curve is for minus uh, f of x. Right. So, if you see that is a mirror image, right. So, the minimum of this function f of x is located over here. Uh, the value at which the minimum occurs is x star, right. So, at x star, if you see, uh, it is also the same point at which the maximum of this uh, minus f of x occurs, right. So, x star remains the same, right. So, the objective function would be this uh, if you are minimizing f of x. So, let us say if you get 2 over here, over here you would get minus 2. Right. So, but x star would be the same. So, if we know that we are actually, let us say we had a uh, optimization problem which said uh, maximize f of x and we got a value of let us say 2 and if we minimize it, minimize, if we do minus minimize, uh, if we do minimize negative of f of x, we will get a solution minus 2. So, this can be brought back to this actual value by just multiplying a with a negative sign. There would not be any change at the point at which the maxima or the minima occurs, right. So, x star remains the same and that is the task, right, to find out the uh, value of x at which a function is either maximum or minimum. So, the objective function just like the decision variables can be bounded or unbounded, right. And uh, there are some special problem called as feasibility problems in which there is no objective function. Right, but there are a set of constraints uh, that need to be satisfied. So, for example, Sudoku problem is a uh, example for feasibility problem. We did briefly discuss how this feasibility problem can be converted into an optimization problem, right. So, in feasibility problem, we only have constraints. In an optimization problem, we may or may not have restrictions on the decision variable. Uh, now that we have discussed decision variables and objective function, let us move on to constraints, right. So, Broadly constraints can be of two types, one is uh, inequality constraints and the other one is equality constraints. So, inequality constraints usually arise when we have resource constraints that something has to be less than or equal to something or something requires to be greater than or equal to something, right. So, in general they are denoted by g of x less than 0, but it can be converted into greater than 0 or greater than equal to 0 uh, by just multiplying with a negative sign. Right. So, if x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 10, if this is the requirement, then then it is the same as prescribing minus x1 plus x2 
is greater than or equal to minus 10, not plus 10, but uh, minus 10 over here, right. So, just like objective function, uh, the constraints can also be converted from less than equal to form to greater than equal to form or vice versa greater than equal to form to less than equal to form by multiplying with a negative sign on both the sides of the equation. So, equality constraints are uh, usually considered uh, very difficult to satisfy. In general, they are denoted by h of x is equal to 0, right. So, here we have two examples that x1 plus x2 is equal to 3 and uh, over here x e to the power minus x square minus y square should be equal to 5. So, the task over here is to come up for if this is our constraint, the task here is to come up with the values of x1 and x2 such that if we add both of this number, it should be exactly equal to 3, right. So, 3.000001 is not allowed and 2.99999 is also not allowed, right. So, that is why these constraints are very difficult to satisfy. So, usually some tolerance is given, right. So, this equality constraint uh, usually uh, tolerance is given to that. So, when we actually start solving a problem, we will look into that. So, based on these constraints, uh, a solution can be classified either as feasible solution or an infeasible solution. So, if a solution satisfies all the constraints in a problem, it is said to be a feasible solution and if a, inf uh, and if a solution does not satisfy even one constraint, it is said to be an infeasible solution. So, we may ha have 100 constraints, a solution may satisfy 99 constraints and may be failing on uh, one constraint, uh, failing in the sense it is not able to satisfy uh, the requirement. Even in that case, the solution is to be classified as infeasible solution, right. And again, constraints can be classified as hard constraints and soft constraints, right. So, hard constraints are those that have to be satisfied so that a solution has to be accepted. Soft constraints are those which can be allowed to uh, relax to some extent to accept a solution, right. So, just let us look at couple of examples to understand the feasibility of solution. So, here we have uh, objective function. Right. So, the decision variables are x1 and x2. Right. So, now we are supposed to find out the values of x1 and x2 such that when those values are plugged into this part, that should result in a value which is greater than or equal to 300. Right. So, if it, if, does, if it does not happen, then the solution is said to be an infeasible solution. So, for example, consider the solution x1 is equal to 3 and x2 is equal to 10 and another solution x1 is equal to 8 and x2 is equal to 6. So, if we calculate the objective function for uh, both of this, right. So, if I plug 3 comma 10 in this uh, expression, right, uh, we will get uh, 7.05 and if we plug this 8 comma 6, we will get a value of 16.34. And if we calculate this right hand side of this constraint that pi x1 square x2 by 4, if we calculate that part it turns out to be 70.69 uh, for solution 1 and in solution 2 it turns out to be 301.59, right. So, if we look at the objective function f1 and f2, 7.05 is better than 16.34 because our objective is to minimize. However, this solution uh, does not satisfy the constraint that 70.69 is not greater than equal to 300, right. So, this solution is an infeasible solution, right. It violates the uh, constraint, it is an infeasible solution. Whereas, this solution, the solution S2 is a feasible solution since it satisfies the constraint, right. So, solution 2 would be preferred to solution 1, right, despite the fact that F1 uh, is better than F2 because the problem is minimizing. So, a feasible solution is to be preferred uh, to an infeasible solution, right. No matter how good is the objective function value for an infeasible solution, it does not matter uh, because it does not satisfy the constraints uh, which is a requirement. So, now let us look at uh, what is a bounded and an unbounded problem, right. So, let us say we have a function f which is 3 x 1 plus 2 x 2, right and we are supposed to minimize that, right. So, and if there are no restrictions of on x 1 and x 2, then x1 and x2 can take a value of minus infinity and minus infinity, right. And the problem, uh, the objective function value itself will be minus infinity. So, this problem is known as an unbounded problem. So, the minimum value of f is uh, minus infinity, 
right. So, now if we put constraints on the decision variable, so the decision variables x1 and x2 here they were uh, unrestricted right. So, x1 and x2 could have taken any values between minus infinity to plus infinity. Now, we have restricted that x1 has to be between 100 and 700 and x2 has to be between 50 and 100 right. So, we have this line this this is x1 this is x2. So, x1 has to be uh, greater than or equal to 100. So, we have this line right and then x1 has to be less than or equal to 700. So, we have this this line right. So, x1 the feasible region of x1 is from here to here. Now, we plot the feasible region of x2. So, x2 has to be greater than or equal to 50. So, any value over here is infeasible with respect to x2. With respect to x1 it is feasible, but with respect to x2 it is infeasible. Similarly, x2 has to be less than or equal to 100 right. So, any value over here is infeasible with respect to uh, x2 right. So, the feasible region now is bounded. So, it is in this region that we are supposed to locate the best solution right. So, um, in this case it happens that uh, this objective function 3 x1 plus 2 x2 will have a minimum value uh, of 400 at this point. Any other point if you calculate uh, inside this uh, entire feasible region, uh, you would see that it has a uh, objective function value which is actually greater than 400. So, since we are looking at a minimization problem, the least value that we can have for this problem with these constraints is uh, 400. Right? So, now let us add one more constraint that the values of x1 and x2 should satisfy this constraint that x1 minus 3 x2 should be greater than or equal to 400. So, to graphically plot what we will plot is uh, x1 minus 3 x2 is equal to 400. Remember our constraint is greater than or equal to 400, but we are plotting this line x1 minus 3 x2 equal to 400. This line can be plotted. This is a region right greater than or equal to 400 is a region. So, let us uh, so in order to plot this line uh, what we can do is uh, we can take x1 to be 0 right. If we take x1 to be 0 right. So, then minus 3 x2 is equal to 400 which implies x2 is equal to 133.33. Similarly, so that gives 1 point 0 comma 133.33 that is 1 point. The second point is we will keep x2 as 0 and calculate the value of x1. So, it will come turn out to be 0 comma 400. So, now we have 2 points right. So, we can draw this line over here which is shown right. So, that line passes through 0 comma 133.33 and 0 uh, and 400 comma 0 right. So, that line is plotted and so this feasible region which we had over here this rectangle has now been uh, reduced to this particular region right this shaded uh, part which is shown shown here right. So, that is because uh, in this region x1 minus 3 x2 is greater than 400 whereas in the region above this right it will not satisfy this constraint mm, x1 minus 3 x2 will be less than or equal to 400. So, you can try out some values. So, for example, if you substitute this particular value 100 comma 100 in this equation right. So, 100 minus 3, 3 times 100 right uh, that will be minus 200 which is not greater than 400. So, this point is to is not feasible. So, similarly, uh, all the points above this line are infeasible right and over here we are restricted by this line x1 is 700 and over here we are restricted by this line uh, x2 equal to 50. So, this uh, triangle which we see here uh, that is the feasible region. So, as you can see as we add a constraint the feasible region uh, decreases right. So, here there are two types of constraints one is redundant constraint and one is non redundant constraint right. So, a redundant constraint does not help you to uh, reduce the feasible region, a non redundant constraint helps you to reduce the feasible region. So, the optimal uh, solution for this problem is uh, x1 is equal to 550, x2 is equal to 50. So, if we plug these two values in this objective function 3 x1 plus 2 x2, we will get a uh, objective function value of 1750 right. So, when we do linear programming, this problem is a linear programming uh, problem. When we actually do linear programming, uh, you will see that how did we arrive at this solution. Uh, right now, what you need to understand is uh, what is a feasible region and what is an infeasible region. So, at times we can even have bounds on the objective function, though it is very rare, but it is possible, right. 
So, in that case if we see this is the line uh, 3 x 1 plus 2 x 2. So, just like we plotted x 1 minus 3 x 2 is equal to 400, uh, we can also plot a line 3 x 1 plus 2 x 2 is equal to 1800. Right. So, if we plot this line it will turn out to be this line. Right. So, now the feasible regi region is even reduced. So, here if you see this star which is over here uh, has actually moved over. Right. So, the optimal solution is 1800. Here we are limited by the objective function. 1750 is possible, that solution is possible, but since we have this additional constraint that the fitness function has to be greater than or equal to 1800, right, uh, the solution actually uh, is 1800. Right. So, this solution becomes infeasible, 1750 becomes infeasible because there is a constraint that the fitness, uh, the objective function has to be greater than or equal to 1800. So, in this case we had bounds on the decision variable. So, over here there is a small uh, typo, right. So, minus 3 x 2 is equal to 400. So, if we are to calculate x 2 it has to be minus 400 by 3 and this has to be minus 133 by 3, right. So, the line is still drawn correctly, but just that we had a typo over there. So, in the previous example we had seen uh, the decision variables they were explicitly bounded. However, it is not necessary that the decision variables need to be explicitly bounded for the problem to be a bounded problem. So, the objective function is minimize 3 x 1 plus 2 x 2, the constraint is 2 x 1 plus x 2 greater than 5. So, we do the same thing that we took it, we take it as t x 1 plus x 2 is equal to 5 and then take two values of x 1, calculate the values of x 2 and we will be able to plot this line. Right? So, this line indicates 2 x 1 plus x 2 equal to 5 and the, similar to the calculation that we discussed uh, in the previous slide, this is this would be the area of feasibility. Similarly, we can also plot these two lines x 1 plus x 2 is equal to 4 and we take two values of x 1, determine what is the value of x 2 and plot it. Right? So, this line is going to be uh, x 1 plus x 2 is equal to 4 and this line is going to be x 1 minus x 2 equal to 2. So, any region below this x 1 plus x 2 curve, uh, x 1 plus x 2 equal to 4 line is feasible region. So, this is a feasible region, right. So, this is also a feasible region. Similarly, uh, for the other for the other line x 1 minus x 2 is less than equal to 2. So, this is the feasible region, right. So, if we plot all the three feas uh, all the feasible regions of the constraint, we will be left with only the shaded regions, right. The, because let us say uh, any value which is feasible for this x 1 plus x 2 equal to 4 need not be feasible for 2 x 1 plus x 2 uh, greater than equal to 5. That is why some of the area which is feasible for uh, let us say this constraint is not feasible for this constraint. Right? So, the common area which is feasible for all the three constraints is our feasible region. So, the optima has to be located in this feasible region. So, here if you see x 1 and x 2 can vary from minus infinity to infinity right there is no explicit bound on x1 and x2 still the problem is a bounded problem so for us to declare a problem is uh, is feasible or not we need to actually look into the nature of the constraints right merely by looking into the bounds of the variables it's not possible to say whether the problem is bounded or unbounded for an arbitrary optimization problem so this is a case wherein we show uh, a infeasible problem that the conf constraints are conflicting so over here also the over here the objective function is minimize 2 x 1 plus 3 x 2 and the constraints are 4 x 1 plus x 2 is less than 5, 3 x 2 is greater than equal to 4 and x 1 minus x 2 is greater than or equal to 3 and again x 1 and x 2 can vary from minus infinity to plus infinity. right? So, if we plot these three lines again plotting the lines is as we discussed previously, we take we convert this into a equality constraint generate two points and since it is a linear equation we draw straight lines. right? In this case the feasible region for each constraint is uh, indicated by this dotted arrows. right? So, for the constraint x 1 minus x 2 greater than 3 this is the feasible region below the constraint. For this curve 3 x 2 for this line 3 x 2 greater than or equal to 4 right? this is this is that line 3 x 2 3 x 2 equal to 4. Right. So, basically what we are saying is x 2 is equal to 1.33. So, x 2 has to be greater than 1.33. So, it is this region. In this region x the value of x 2 is greater than 1.33. Similarly, we plot the line x 1 minus x 2 equal to 3. Right. So, we this region is the infeasible uh, this region is the feasible region. Right. So, now if we see there is no common area for this three constraints. 
in this case we call the problem as infeasible problem. So, another easy way to understand is let us say there is a constraint which says x has to be greater than or equal to 2 and another constraint which says x has to be uh, less than or equal to 1 right. So, any value of x which is less than or equal to 1 is feasible for this constraint. For this constraint any value of x which is actually greater than or equal to 2 is feasible right. So, if I have to satisfy both these constraints there is no single value of x which will satisfy both of these equations right. So, in this case these two equations put together make the problem infeasible. Uh, another term which we will be commonly using is uh, contours. So, contours are lines which have identical objective function value. So, for example, here if we see if I if we take x 1 is equal to 2 and x 2 is equal to 4 it will give objective function value of 20. If we take x 1 is equal to 4 x 2 is equal to 2 we will get a objective function value of 20. If we take x 1 is equal to 1 and fix f to be 20 right we can actually find out what is the value of x 2. So, similarly we can generate many points and then we can plot. So, this is x 1 this is x 2 right. So, all these values can be plotted 2 comma 4, 4 comma 2, 1 comma whatever we get over here 3 comma something, 0 comma something. So, we would get a curve like this. So, this is called as contour. So, all the points on this curve have an function value of 20 right. So, similarly uh, we can plot contours for 10, we can plot contours for 5. So, similarly we can plot contours for other values right. So, this is known as contour plot. So, this shows us uh, how the objective function behaves in the search space. So, the, our search space is x 1 is equal to minus phi to phi and x 2 is equal to minus phi to phi. So, in this region how the objective function varies right. So, all the points in this curve will have an objective function value of 20, all the points in on this uh, contour will have a uh, va function value of phi. Right? So, uh, very often we will be referring to this contour plot and then we have something called as realizations right. So, realizations are those solutions which have the same objective function value, but different decision variable value. So, for example, uh, if you remember the slide uh, in which the flight costs were given, you may have two different flights which have which uh, which may have the same cost right. So, from from the perspective of the objective function which is cost in our case, the value is same, but the decision variables can be different right. So, those are called as realizations right. So, for example, if we have this problem uh, maximize f is equal to x 1 x 2 subject to these two constraints x 1 plus x 2 should be equal to 3 and x 1 minus x 2 should be less than equal to 1 and bounded by the constraint that x 1 and x 2 should be greater than or equal to 0. So, if we plot that, so this is the line x 1 plus x 2 equal to 3 right and this is the line x 1 minus x 2 uh, equal to 1 right. So, since this is a less than equal to 1, so it this is the feasible region as indicated by these dotted arrows. Right. And the feasible region is also this line this x 1 plus x 2 equal to 3 uh, because the points that are lying on this straight line x 1 plus x 2 equal to 3 only those points satisfy this constraint right. So, the intersection point of these two constraint is over here and remember this entire region is feasible right. Uh, uh, this entire region is uh, feasible because it has x 1 minus x 2 is less than equal to 1. So, we have one more point over here in addition to this right. So, those two points are x 1 is equal to 1, x 2 is equal to 2 and x 1 is equal to 2 and x 2 equal to 1. So, at both these places the objective function value is 2 right. So, these are called as realizations right same objective function value, but different uh, decision variables right. In one case x 1 is in one case the solution is 1 comma 2 and in the other case the solution is 2 comma 1. So, this is an example uh, again for uh, realization right. So, here uh, we need to design a can right what we can vary is the uh, diameter and the height right and the diameter and height uh, has to be between 0 and 31. So, the constraint is that the can should have a volume of at least 300 ml right. So, the volume is given by pi d square h by 4. So, this has to be greater than equal to 300 because we have at least right. So, if it is more than 300 it is fine, but we want at least 300 ml. So, that is why we have this greater than equal to constraint and the objective is to minimize the material cost of the can right. So, that if you see 
uh, C denotes the cost and this will correspond to the material cost of the can. So, in this case if we take uh, the diameter as 8 centimeter and if we take the height as 10 centimeter, the objective function value would be 22.87 and uh, if we take the diameter as 5 centimeter and the height as 19.9 centimeter, the objective function value which is the cost would still be 22.87. So, the can can either look like this or it can look like this, right. So, here uh, the height is smaller uh, than the this can, but in both cases the cost is 22.87, right. So, depending upon other constraints, one can choose either this solution or this solution, right, without compromising on the objective function value. So, that is why it is good to know the realizations, not only the optimal solution, but also many instances in which the same optimal cost can be obtained. Now, let us look at uh, monotonic function and convex functions, right. So, we will be using this term very often. So, monotonic functions are functions which are either continuously increasing or decreasing with respect to x. So, for example, in this case if we increase as we increase x, the value of let us say this is f of x keeps increasing, right. So, it has a monotonic uh, nature to it. Here in the second fig plot if we in the second figure if we see if we keep increasing x, f of x continuously decreases, right. So, this is also monotonic, this is also monotonic. It does not matter whether it is increasing or decreasing as long as, as, long as it is consistently increasing or decreasing. Whereas, this third plot is an example of a non-monotonic function, right. So, here if we see as we increase x, f of x is first decreasing till here and as we keep increasing x, f of x is increasing and again as we keep uh, uh, increasing x, f of x is decreasing, right. So, here if you see from here to here, uh, from in this region the function is monotonically decreasing, in this region the function is monotonically increasing and again in this region the function is monotonically decreasing. When we have functions behaving like this, those are known as non-monotonic functions. We will also be using this term convex functions very often, right. So, convex functions most of you would be knowing convex function, right. So, convex function if we take any two points in the line, right. So, for example, if I take this point and if I take this point and if I were to draw a straight line connecting these two points, right. So, the line would be above the curve, right. So, if that happens that is known as a convex function. So, that is the geometrical uh, interpretation of convex function. Mathematically, let us say if this is, if I took two points x1 and x2, right. So, their, uh, uh, their corresponding fitness function value is f of x1 and f of x2, right. So, uh, as of, so we have two points x1, its corresponding y value or the function value is f of x1. We have x2, its corresponding function value is f of x2. And if we take any point, right. So, let us say we take this point x3, right. So, x3 is a linear combination of x1 and x2, right. So, uh, we can express x3 is equal to gamma x1 plus 1 minus gamma x2, right. So, and again we can calculate f of x3. So, f of x3 is nothing but f of gamma x1 plus 1 minus gamma x2, right. So, that is what is written over here. So, this is nothing but f of x3, right. So, that would be less than, if that is less than gamma times f of x1 plus 1 minus gamma times f of x2, then the function is a convex function. So, as you can see a convex function uh, will have only one point at which the gradient vanishes, right. So, we will have only one optimal solution, right. So, the local optima itself will be the global optima. So, whenever we have a convex function, we it is sufficient if we find the stationary point and for th at that stationary point the function is bound to be minimum, right. So, it is not necessary to uh, calculate the higher derivatives. And then we have unimodal functions and multimodal functions, right. So, unimodal functions are those for some value of m, if the function is monotonically increasing for x less than m and monotonically decreasing for x greater than or equal to m. Right. So, these are examples of monotonically, uh, uh, these are examples of unimodal function. So, if you see we basically have one peak, right. So, till this point uh, the function is, so this is our m, this is our m. So, till that point the function is actually increasing, after that it is decreasing, right. So, we basically have this uh, one peak. So, those are called as uni, unimodal function, right. 
Similarly, what we have shown is over here for maximization, right. So, for minimization it can be it continuously decreases till a particular value and then increases beyond that value. So, this is also a uni, unimodal uh, function, right. So, for a unimodal function, uh, the maximum value of f of x is f of m, right. So, here if we see uh, the value of the function is maximum at m, right. So, that is a nice property about uh, unimodal function, right and it has only one, one peak, right. So, there are no other local maxima. These are examples of multimodal functions, right. So, for example, as x increases, uh, here it's, it is increasing then it is decreasing and still if x is increasing this is starting to increase right so here if we see we have uh, multiple peaks over here and multiple val uh, multiple uh, values over here right so this plot shows in one dimensional so here the plot is between x and f of x here it is between uh, x1 x2 and f so it's a 3d plot so now if we see traps are there right so there are lot of valleys there are lot of peaks if our problem is to maximize is to find out the peak that is that has the best value uh, despite there being so many other peaks and if our problem is to minimize the objective function then our task is to find out the values of x1 and x2 at which the objective function has a uh, lowest value. So, that is unimodal and multimodal functions. So, most real life optimization problems are multi multimodal in nature. So, optimal solutions can be uh, said to be either uh, local or global, right. So, what we are discussing here is with, res is with respect to uh, minimization problem, uh, but the same thing can be extended to maximization problem. So, local optima means the smallest function value in its neighborhood, right. So, for example, if we take this point, uh, in its neighborhood it has the least value, right. Same thing this point, it has the least uh, value in, in its neighborhood, right. So, all those four points are. Uh, local optima, right. So, for a problem uh, there can be multiple local optima. For global optima, it is the smallest function value in the entire feasible region. So, the difference is over here. So, local optima is the smallest function value in its neighborhood, whereas global optima is the smallest function value in the entire feasible region, right. Uh, so, here if we see out of these four points, 1, 2, 3 and 4, right. Uh, all the four points are local optima, right, because they are the le they have the least value in their neighborhood, whereas this particular point uh, is actually lowest among the entire feasible region. So, if our feasible region is from here to here for f of x uh, for a uni for a single variable optimization problem, then we can see that the best solution is over here. These are also uh, uh, local optima, but this is the global optima, right. So, if the function is convex, right, only one global optima exists and there will be no local optima, right. So, that is why we looked into a convex function just to understand what is uh, global optima. So, if our function is convex in nature, then if we are able to find an optima, we do not need to worry about whether it is global optima or local optima because there is only one optimal solution, right. If the function is not convex or the function is multimodal, then most algorithms fail to determine the global optimal solution. That is why nonlinear programming uh, is still an open area of research. To consolidate whatever we have seen so far, so we had seen what are the components of an optimization problem. We have decision variable, objective function and uh, constraints, right. So, decision variable can be either continuous or it can be semi-continuous, it can be integer or a set objective function uh, can be continuous or discontinuous. We saw how we can convert a maximization problem into a minimization problem or vice versa. In constraints we saw basically there are two types of uh, constraints. Uh, one is inequality constraints and another one is equality constraints. So, inequality constraints are of the form g of x is less than equal to 0. If we happen to have a constraint which is actually having let us say 3 x square plus 5 y is greater than 10 greater than or equal to 10, then uh, we can multiply that equation by a minus sign on both sides and the inequality sign would get reversed, right. So, that is what we saw as components of optimization problem. Then we looked into certain features about uh, optimization problem. We saw what is boundary region, uh, what is a feasible solution, what is an infeasible solution, what are realizations. Then we looked into what are uh, unimodal functions and multimodal function. We saw what is a convex function. 
and then we also try to understand uh, what is a local optima and a global optima. The global optima is what we are interested because we are interested in the value of the objective function uh, which is the least in the entire uh, feasible region. Now let us look into how do we classify uh, optimization problems, right? Uh, this is a typical optimization uh, problem, right? So uh, let us say we have an objective function uh, which involves x which stand for the continuous variable and y which stands for uh, binary variables or integer variables. So even if we have sets that can be converted into uh, integer variable, right? So basically if we have an objective function which involves both the continuous variable and binary variable, similarly we have constraints g uh, which involve the continuous variable and binary variable and inequality constraint. So this is inequality constraint, this is equality constraint and then we have uh, bounds for each of the variable. So x belongs to the real domain or we can have a bound constraint that a particular value of x can be between let us say 5 and 10. Let us say if we have two variables x1 is between x1 has to be between 5 and 10 and x2 has to be between let us say 50 and 70. Right? So those are the bound constraints. Similarly for the integer variables or binary variables we can have that y can y1 can take values uh, 1, 2, 3 uh, whereas y2 another variable can take values uh, 8, 9, uh, let us say 10, 11, 12 and so on. Right? So this is a generic representation of an optimization problem. We have continuous variable, we have discrete variable. Uh, we have inequality constraints, we have equality constraints. Right? So here if we see uh, these three are actually functions f of x comma y, g of x comma y and h of x comma y are actually functions. Right? So function we can classify as linear or non-linear and decision variable we will just restrict ourselves to whether it is continuous variable or integer variable. Right? So we are as of now we are ignoring for classifying these problems we are ignoring the semi-continuous variable. So variables can be continuous or discrete right? or integer, right? discrete is, stands for integer also. The objective function can be linear or non-linear, the constraints can be linear or non-linear. So depending upon this we have 5 classes of problem, right? broadly 5 classes of problem. One is called as linear programming, so linear programming as the name indicates right? the functions are going to be linear, right? so the objective function is going to be linear the constraints are going to be uh, linear. right? So non-linearity is not allowed either in the objective function or in the constraints and since it does not mention anything about the nature of the decision variable. So when we say linear programming we are not refer we are not explicitly specifying what is the nature of the decision variable. So by default it means only continuous variable, discrete variables are not allowed. So a linear programming is a problem in which the objective function and uh, the constraints are linear and the variables are continuous. No non-linearity is allowed in the constraints or the objective function and the variables cannot be discrete. So that is linear programming. So similarly non-linear programming the variables cannot be discrete. Uh, we are not explicitly specifying anything about the nature of the decision variable in the name. right? So the decision variable have to be only continuous. The objective function can be either linear or non-linear and the constraints can be either linear or non-linear. Right? So it is possible that uh, some of the constraints are linear, some of the constraints are non-linear but if we have even one single constraint which is a non-linear, uh, which is non-linear, uh, it falls under the category of non-linear programming. Uh, for integer linear programming, uh, the name itself specifies integer. Right? So that means only discrete variables are allowed, continuous variables are not allowed and since it is linear programming, uh, objective function and constraints should be only linear, right? non-linearity is not allowed uh, in integer linear programming. Mm -hmm. Then we have mixed integer linear programming, so as the name indicates mixed integer, right? so that means continuous variables are also there, discrete variables are also there, uh, linear programming, right? so non-linear objective function is not allowed, non-linear constraint is not allowed, the objective function has to be linear and the constraint have to be linear. In mixed integer non-linear programming, right, uh, the variables, some of the variables can be continuous, some of the variables can be integer. The objective function can be either be linear or non-linear and the constraints can either be linear or non-linear.
right. So, these are the 5 categories of problem. Obviously, you can also have integer nonlinear programming wherein uh, either the objective function or uh, the constraints are wherein the objective function or the constraints are uh, nonlinear in nature. So, this gives the consolidated uh, picture of whatever we have discussed. Now that we have classified problems, uh, there are various ways to classify optimization techniques, right. For this course, we will classify broadly into three categories. One is mathematical programming techniques, meta heuristic techniques and what we call it as other techniques, right. So, this is something that we are not going to see as part of this course. So, in this course, we will be primarily focusing on uh, meta heuristic techniques. We will also touch upon uh, mathematical programming techniques, right. So, mathematical programming techniques are based on geometrical properties of the problem. So, if it is uh, the algorithm themselves are designed uh, taking into account the nature of the problem. So, for example, for linear programming problem, we have something called as simplex algorithm. So, that explicitly exploits the fact that the objective function and the constraints are linear in nature. Right. Um, similarly, nonlinear programming make use of the nature of the function to design the algorithm. So, some of the nonlinear programming techniques are uh, steepest descent Newton's method, quasi Newton method. Uh, for integer programming problems, we have branch and bound and cutting planes. Right. Interior point algorithm can be used for linear programming as well as nonlinear programming. Right. So, here for this course, we will only be looking at uh, linear programming from the perspective of mathematical programming techniques, we will be looking into linear programming only with uh, simplex algorithm and for uh, mixed integer linear programming, we will be looking into uh, branch and bound. There are various other mathematical programming techniques for non-linear programming and mixed integer non-linear programming which we would not be covering in this course, right. From the perspective of meta heuristic techniques, so these are nature inspired techniques, right. So, we will be looking into genetic algorithm, particle swarm optimization, differential evolution, teaching learning based optimization, artificial bee colony optimization. Uh, we will be looking into these 5 techniques. Uh, there are obviously lot of other techniques uh, which come up every year, right, but we will be restricting it to uh, these techniques. So, these techniques do not necessarily exploit the structure of the problem. So, the way we solve a linear programming problem using meta heuristic technique is the same way we will be solving a non-linear programming problem or a mixed integer linear programming problem or a mixed integer non-linear programming problem. Uh, so, these techniques uh, consider the problem as uh, a black box optimization problem. So, we will look into it in detail uh, as and when we uh, start looking into meta heuristic techniques. So, just for the sake of our knowledge, let us also look into multi objective optimization, right. So, in single whatever we discussed so far was with respect to single objective optimization. In multi objective optimization, we have more than one objective. When we say more than one objective, that means the objectives are conflicting in nature. Conflicting in the sense like if we try to uh, improve uh, in one objective, we end up deteriorating the other objective and both the objectives are equally important, right. So, that is when we have multi objective uh, optimization, right. So, a classical example from uh, Professor Kalyan Mai Deb's book, right. So, here uh, someone wants to buy a car, 5 options uh, A, B, C, D, E, right. So, all the cost of the cars are different and the comfort that it provides is also different. So, the cost of car A is somewhere around 1. Uh, 1k in some arbitrary monetary units and the comfort level that it provides is 30, 30 percent, right. Whereas, car E uh, is has a cost of 100k and the comfort level it provides, provides is 90, 90 percent, right. So, if someone were to say that uh, their objective is to maximize, uh, let us say, uh, the comfort, then obviously, car E is the best choice because the solutions A, B, C, D have a lower value of uh, the comfort. Right. So, that is easy, uh, that is single objective optimization. Same way if someone were to say that minimizing cost is their objective, then it is easy to choose car A because it has the lowest cost. But if someone were to say that maximizing comfort and minimizing cost is their objective, then all these 5 solutions A, B, C, D, E are equally good, right. So, for example, if we take, uh, if we compare uh, car C uh, and car E. So, car C has a lower cost, right, but a lower comfort. So, C cannot be uh, eliminated when compared to car E, 
that is because because the cost is lower for C and we want to minimize the cost whereas car E cannot be uh, eliminated because the comfort is better than that for car C right. So all these five points are equally good and we have what is called as Pareto solutions right uh, or the set of non-dominating solutions right. So there is no solution which dominates these solutions so non-dominating uh, solutions. So similarly if we go back to that previous example which we had that we want to select a flight right and the objective is to have the duration of the flight should be minimum as well as the cost should be minimum that both we want minimize F1 and minimize F2, F2 is price and F1 is let us say duration. So for example these two if we consider 6211, 6211 this takes 2 hours 15 minutes and this flight takes 2 hours 45 minutes so this solution can be eliminated because uh, we are not compromising on the cost right whereas we have a better uh, duration I mean lower duration with, with this particular flight. If we compare 6411 and 6211 obviously this is better in cost but this solution has a lower duration right. So between this first two flights it is difficult to eliminate uh, any, any particular solution. Again this solution can be eliminated this right because we have a solution which says 2 hours 45 minutes and the cost is 6211. Here the cost is also higher, the duration is also higher, so this solution can be eliminated. So here if we see again this solution uh, can be eliminated because we have a higher cost as well as the duration is uh, longer than these two. So in this case we have only two solutions for two objectives whereas in this case in this car problem even for two objectives we had uh, five solutions right. So it is not uh, in multi objective optimization very often students have this misconception that if there are two objectives then there are two solutions that is not the case right. With two objectives you can have even zero solutions, you can have infinite uh, solutions in the Pareto front or you can have a discrete Pareto front defined by a finite number of points. So the search space in multi objective optimization and single objective optimization. So in single objective optimization let us say we have a three variable problem x1 and x2, x3 and this shaded region let us say is the feasible region then any point in this feasible region actually corresponds to a scalar value in the objective function uh, in the objective function space right. So this is just a linear, uh, linear line right. So it is much easier to say which solution is better. So for example uh, let us say one solution is over here and another solution corresponds to this particular value if this is F1 and this is F2 and if the objective is to maximize then F2 is better than F1. So it is easy to make a make that call because uh, we are comparing only two scalar values right. Uh, in multi objective optimization every point in this search space x1, x2, x3 are the decision variables. So every point over here actually corresponds to a point uh, in a if we have two objectives then it corresponds to a point in a two dimensional space right. So this point is over here and this point is over here right. Here the search process is little bit more complicated because uh, we intend to get the set of non-dominating solutions or the Pareto solutions or the trade-off solutions. So formally we can define a Pareto solution as that a solution S1 is set to dominate solution S2. So if we have two solutions S1 and S2, S1 is set to dominate S2 if both the following conditions are true. So the first condition is that S1 is not worse than S2 in an any of the objectives right. So it is not definitely bad than S2 in any of the objectives and that S1 has to be strictly better than S2 in at least one of the objectives right. So only then we can say S1 is dominating the solution S2. So if we are given these points uh, again there is a common misconception that uh, for two objective functions to be conflicting uh, one has to be maximum the other has to be minimum or it has to be min max right so that is not correct you can have two objective functions which both need to be maximized and yet they can be uh, conflicting right so this example shows you that thing uh, so for example these are the solutions these are the solution s1 s2 s3 s4 s5 what is shown over here is their objective function values right these are not the decision variable values for some let's say if it is a three variable problem uh, s1 has let's say 289 S2 has let us say 5, 5, 7, 8 and then we have uh, two objective function f1 is equal to let us say some relation between x1, x2, x3 
and f2 is a some relation between x1, x2, x3, right. So, if we plug these decision variable values into these objective function values, we will get f1 and f2 for each of the solution. So, that is what is shown over here. Solution S1 has an objective function value of 9 and an objective function value of 2. Uh, similarly, the other solutions have the respective objective function values. If we compare all these solutions, so let us say let us compare S1 and S2. So, we want to maximize. So, between S1 and S2, it is difficult to pick uh, a solution because uh, S1 is better than S2, right, in F1, whereas S2 is better than F1, right. So, if we do with 3, the same thing that S3 is better in F1, S1 is better than F2 because it has a value of 2. Over here, if we see S4 completely dominates S1 because here we have 11 and 3 and we want to maximize uh, both of this. So, this S1 is definitely not a part of the Pareto solutions because there is this solution which will definitely uh, outrank S1. So, we would never choose S1 if we have S4, right. So, now that we have ruled out S1, let us look at S2, right. So, between S2 and S3, uh, we cannot make a call because S3 is better than F1, better in F1 and S2 is better in uh, F. Let us compare with S4. So, S2 does not lose out to S4 also because we have a 5 over here and a 3 over here, right. Between S2 and S5, again S2 does not lose out, right. So, S2 is definitely going to be the part of uh, Pareto front. So, similarly, you can do the other calculation, right. So, S3 will not lose out to S4 uh, because of this 12 being better, right. But S3 will lose out to S5 because we have a 16 which is better than 12 and we have a 2 which is better than 1. So, S3 loses out to this. Now, we can compare S4 and S5, right. So, 11 and 16, 3 and 2. Right. So, obviously, S4 does not lose out to S5 right? and the other comparisons were made. So, these three solutions form a part of non-dominated points. Right? So, for example, here if you see this solution S2, it had a poor objective function than S1 and S3 right? because it is 8 and this is 9 and 12, but still S2 goes into the Pareto point, S1 and S3 lose out because this S2 has better value of F2 which is why it survives, right. So, suppose for example, if I had to select S1, then instead of selecting S1, I would as well select S4 because it is good in both, both the objectives, right. So, this is an example which helps you to establish that uh, the nature of the function is to be studied before declaring them to be conflicting or not. So, for example, let us have this function that F1 is x cube, F2 is x square and we want to uh, maximize both this function. Right. So, if the feasible region is, let us say, the domain of x is between 0 and infinity, right, then these two variable, then these two functions are non-conflicting, right. I can ignore one of the objective function and just solve with respect to the other objective function. Whatever is the optimal solution I get, that would be the same for this one also. But if we change the domain of the variables from, instead of, instead of from 0 to infinity, if we do it from minus infinity to 0, right, then they become conflicting, right. So, uh, one has to study the nature of the objective function, uh, the constraint and uh, the domain of the decision variable to determine whether two objective functions are conflicting or not, right. So, this is just to give you the difference between single objective and multi-objective optimization. In this course, we will be restricting ourselves to single objective optimization, right. So, let us say we have these four cases, right. Uh, uh, we have these two objective functions, F1 and F2 if both are to be minimized, right, so your Pareto front would look something like this. So, this uh, highlighted part uh, is what is the Pareto front, right. So, all the solutions uh, in the direction of 0, 0 would form the Pareto front, right. If your uh, objective function f1 is to be minimized and f2 is to be maximized, right, so then we are looking at solutions which are pointing in the direction of uh, 0, comma infinity. Uh, so, here as you can see the Pareto front, here it was continuous, here it can be discrete, right. So, these points are actually inferior points, you can work out just like you can randomly select one point over here and compare, you will see that these highlighted points actually dominate uh, the, the, the other points, right. Uh, so, if you have a max min, then we are looking at, uh, so this has to be F1. Right. Then we are looking at infinity comma 0, 
right points uh, so this direction is the Pareto front. So, if the both the objectives are to be maximized right then we are looking at uh, the points which are towards uh, infinity comma infinity right. Just like we had realizations in single objective optimization, we can have realization in multiple objective optimization, right. So, let us consider two solutions x1 and x2 and there are some let us say there is some uh, function f1 and f2 uh, uh, which is a relation of x1, x2, x3 and this is also a relation of x1, x2, x3, right. So, here if we see if these two solutions are different, right. Here it means x1 is 5, x2 is 2 x 3 is 1 right. So, over here it indicates x 1 is 4 x 2 is 3 and x 3 is 5 right. So, in this case what happen uh, in this case it can still happen depending upon what the objective function which we have both f 1 and f 2 values are same right. So, this is called as realization these are not trade off solutions the objective function is exactly identical both in x 1 and x 2 right. So, these are not trade off solutions, but these are realizations in multi objective optimization. So, just like we had realizations in single objective optimization, we can have realization in multi, uh, multi objective optimization, right. So, here two points correspond to the same value in the uh, objective function space. So, this is f 1 comma f 2, right. Now, let us come back to single objective optimization. First, we will see how to find out the optima for a single variable problem, right. There is only one decision variable whose value is to be found, right. Again we are not considering the case wherein the constraints are there. So, we have an unconstrained optimization problem and single variable problem, right. So, in that case the maxima or minima is located at the stationary point. So, stationary point you would have uh, come across in your uh, higher secondary education, right. So, those can be determined by equating the gradient of the function to 0. So, if it is a single variable problem, uh, if you have a function f of x, right, and if you want to find out the stationary point of this, then equate uh, equate the derivative to 0. So, that will give the stationary point, right. Stationary point only tells that either a minima or maxima occurs at that point. You will have to uh, uh, check the condition of the second derivative, right. So, the second derivative has to be evaluated at this stationary point. So, if the second derivative is positive, uh, then it is a minimum. If the second derivative is negative, then it is a maximum, right. If the second derivative is 0, then it is a saddle point. So, in, in for single variable, we need to look at uh, higher derivatives to decide. So, in terms of multivariable problem, uh, we will have what is this Jacobian. Uh, so, the Jacobian has to be equated to 0. So, we will solve a multivariable problem. So, you would better understand. Uh, and the second derivative is nothing but Hessian matrix. Again, we will show you that. So, if the Hessian matrix is positive definite, then it indicates that the stationary point is minimum. If the Hessian is negative definite, then uh, it indicates that uh, the stationary point is maximum. And if it is indefinite, then again it is a saddle point. So, it is not possible to decide whether uh, at that point the function has a minimum value or a maximum value. So, let us consider this single variable problem f of x is equal to x cube plus 3 x square minus 6 x, right. So, if you take the gradient of this that works out to be 3 x square plus 6 x minus 6, right. So, we will have two stationary points. So, now this has to be equated to 0. So, this is a quadratic equation. So, if we get if we solve it, we will get two, two stationary points, right. So, the solution of the equation a x square plus b x plus c equal to 0 is x is equal to minus b plus or minus root of b square minus 4 a c by 2 a. So, if we apply this, then we will get these two values, right. So, x is equal to 0.73 is a 0.732 is a stationary point x is equal to minus 2.732 is a stationary point, right. So, these are stationary points. So, at, with this information, it is not possible to say whether the function is minima or maxima, right. So, we need to find out the second derivative, right. So, second derivative for this is 6x plus 6, right. Now, the second derivative has to be evaluated at each of the stationary point 0.732 and minus 2.732, right. So, if we, uh, if we evaluate the second derivative for 0.732 will turn out to be 10.392, right. Since it is positive, it is a minimum, right. Whereas, the second point minus 2.732, since it is negative, it turns out uh, it will be a maxima, 
So, we have a minima at 0 0.732 and we have a maxima at minus 2.732, right. So, this plot shows uh, the variation of x with respect to f of x, right. So, if we vary x from minus phi to phi, uh, this is how the function would look like and here if we see this value is 0 0.732 where you can see it is actually a minima and here it will be the, the function will have a maxima which is minus 2.732. So, let us look into a multivariable function, a multivariable function, right. So, here f of x, right, is uh, involves uh, x1 as well as x2 as well as x3. So, we have three decision variables. So, uh, the Jacobian is nothing but the partial derivative of f re with respect to x1, partial derivative of f with respect to x2 and the partial derivative of f with respect to x3. Since we have three variables, if you have n variables, uh, all the partial derivatives are to be found, right. So, here we, these are the three equations, right. So, if you differentiate it, you would get uh, these three equations. So, this is our Jacobian now, right. So, this has to be equated to 0. So, this if we see it is simultaneous linear equation, right. So, this can be written as uh, 6x1 minus 2x2 mi minus 2x3 is equal to 6, right. So, this equation can be written as 6x1 minus 2x2 minus 2x3 is equal to 6 and the rest of the two equation also can be written and if we see it will be uh, in the form of linear equation which can be said ax equal to b, right. So, if we solve this uh, we will get the values, uh, we will get the stationary point. So, in this case it happens to be 2, 1 and 2, right. So, this is a stationary point again with this we cannot say whether it is a minima or maxima, right. So, we need to determine the second derivative or the Hessian in this case. So, the Hessian is given by dou x square f by dou x1 square, dou square f by dou x1 dou x2 uh, all the way up to dou square f by dou x1 dou x, uh, dou x1 xn. Similarly, we have dou x square f dou x2 x1, dou x square f dou x2 square and uh, so on, right. So, in this case for the three variable problem, uh, we will have to determine these partial derivatives. So, this is, uh, so here we have dou f by dou x1, dou f by dou x2 and dou f by dou x3, right. So, if we do dou x square f by dou x1 square, so this equation if we further differentiate with respect to x1, we will get only 6, right. So, dou x, uh, dou square f by dou x1 dou x2. So, this equation if we differentiate with respect to x2, we will get minus 2, right. Similarly, this one, so dou x2 by dou x3. So, dou x2 is this equation, right. So, we will get only plus 2, right. So, if we plug that, we will get this is our Hessian matrix, right. So, now we will have to see whether it is positive definite or negative definite. So, positive definite uh, if the principal determinant, so this determinant, uh, this determinant and the first 3 cross 3 determinant, if all of this happen to be greater than 0, then it is a positive definite matrix. So, in this case it happens uh, that this is 6, right. So, 6 into 4 minus 2, 2 into uh, minus 2 into minus 2, right. So, that would work out to be 20. In this case, the all these 3 principal determinants happen to be greater than 0, right. So, that is why uh, we can declare this point to be a uh, we can declare Hessian to be positive definite, right. And the stationary point which we found is actually corresponding to a uh, minima. So, again uh, this example we will give it to you, uh, you can solve it, right. So, in this case uh, we have a two variable problem x1 and x2, right. So, if we do dou f by dou x1, dou f by dou x2, that is our Jacobian, if we equate it to 0. Right. So, these two equations uh, can be satisfied by these three points. These three are our stationary points, right. So, for these three stationary points, we need to find out whether the Hessian is uh, positive definite or negative definite, right. So, Hessian again is dou square f by dou x1 square, dou square f by dou x2 square, dou square f by dou x1 dou x2, dou square f by dou x2 dou x1. So, we will need this one and you can again compose uh, the Hessian as shown over here. Right. So, if you compose the Hessian, uh, you will get something similar to, you will get this uh, matrix, right. And then if you find out the eigenvalues of this uh, matrix, 
in the previous slide in the previous problem we only uh, we saw uh, the principal we saw that the principal determinants have to be positive right for a hessian matrix to be positive definite or we can use the eigen value properties that if the eigen values of a matrix is uh, positive right if all the eigen values of a matrix is positive then the matrix is positive definite if all the eigen values are negative then the matrix is negative definite if some of the eigen values are positive and some of the values are negative eigen values are negative then the matrix is said to be uh, indefinite right so in this case if you work out uh, if you find out the eigen values or even if you calculate the determinant of this matrix you will see that uh, you will get it you will get a positive which corresponds which tells that this is a minima this particular stationary point is a minima so for the second point again if we plug in this x1 x2 values into this hessian matrix right uh, if you calculate the eigen values right you will see that uh, all the both the eigen values are positive so again this hessian is a positive definite so this point corresponds to a minima right whereas the third point uh here if we calculate again plug this x1 and x2 into this hessian matrix and if we calculate the eigen values it uh, one of the eigen value is negative and the other is positive so this is indefinite so here it is a saddle point so with this information whatever we have we cannot say whether this is a minima or a maxima so we will be using this concept uh, while we are looking into regression right so the first derivative has to be equated to zero we will get stationary point at that stationary point we need to evaluate the second derivative right uh, if the second derivative is greater than 0 for a single variable problem it corresponds to a minima if the second derivative is less than 0 it corresponds to a maxima for a single variable problem for a multi variable problem we need to uh, equate the jacobian to 0 we will get the stationary point and we need to evaluate the hessian matrix right so for the hessian matrix uh, if it is positive definite then the corresponding stationary point is minima if it is negative definite the corresponding uh, stationary point is maxima so now let us look into the advantages and disadvantages of uh, mathematical programming techniques so the advantages of mathematical programming technique is that it has a guaranteed optimal solution for well structured problems so if the problem is either linear programming mixed integer linear programming or quadratic programming there are algorithms uh, which guarantee that the solution that we'll obtain at the end of the procedure will be globally optimum right so again here uh, in optimization you need to remember we have two things one is that we want the best solution that exists in the search space and the second thing is we want to reach that solution as quickly as possible right given a search space obviously you can uh, evaluate the objective function at each and every every point and see at which point it is minima or maxima but then in a search space there can be infinite points right so that's why we don't do an exhaustive search we rely on optimization techniques right so for these two category of problem uh, these three category of problems uh, there are algorithms right which guarantee the optimality of solution right and mathematical programming techniques are usual uh, are helpful in de bottlenecking right so as in like it can provide reasonable insight into the solution as to what is stopping us from having a better solution uh, that can be uh, inferred from uh, for some problems uh, using mathematical programming techniques right it does not require multiple runs uh, which is the case in meta heuristic techniques right the same technique this for the same problem will have to be run multiple times because it involves stochasticity right so that is not the case in mathematical programming techniques um, again it requires lower computational resources for certain classes of problems and there are no parameters that are to be uh, set by trial and error right so which is the case in uh, meta heuristic techniques right so those are the advantages of mathematical programming techniques the drawbacks include that it has a rigid modeling framework right so all the constraints have to be expressed in this form for example in sudoku problem the constraint that we have is that let's say if we denote a cell by x11 and its neighboring cell as x12 then the constraint that we have is actually x11 is not should not be equal to x12 right but that constraint is not of this form that is like this right so x not equal to y if we have a problem wherein 
we have this constraint that x should not be equal to y that has to be transformed into these such constraints less than equal to or equal to only then mathematical programming techniques can be uh, used right. So, that is a drawback of uh, mathematical programming techniques right. So, they are not naturally amenable to multi objective optimization problems. Uh, so, if we want to solve a multi objective optimization problem using mathematical programming technique then the same problem has to be solved multiple times right. And if it is a combinatorial problem as in like if we have lot of integer variables uh, as the size of the problem increases right the computational time increases exponentially right. So, it can become computationally intensive particularly for combinatorial problem. Uh, usually these techniques are designed to provide one solution right. Some of these drawbacks have been overcome uh, in the softwares uh, like uh, in the software, but in general these are the drawbacks of mathematical programming techniques. Let us now briefly look into uh, the four categories of problem right. So, linear programming in linear programming problem as we discussed the objective function is linear and, and the variables are continuous. So, for linear programming problems it is guaranteed that the optima always occurs at the vertex right and uh, linear programming problems uh, using the simplex and interior point method can be solved to global optimality right. So, that is an advantage of linear programming problem. So, uh, this is a linear programming problem that uh, we have right. So, minimize z is equal to 4 x 1 minus x 2. So, our decision variables are x 1 and x 2. The constraint is that x 1 and x 2 2 x 1 plus x 2 should be less than equal to 8 right. So, again we draw this line 2 x 1 plus x 2 is equal to 8. So, we will get this line. Uh, then we can uh, another constraint that we have is x 2 less than equal to 5. So, that leads to this particular line uh, x 2 less than x 2 equal to 5. So, when we say x 2 less than 5 any value below this is the feasible region right. So, 2 x 1 plus x 2 less than 8 is any value less than uh, I mean in this region is actually a feasible solution with respect to this constraint right. But with respect to this constraint some of the feasible region is lost. Then we have this constraint x 1 minus x 2 is less than equal to 4. So, again we will draw the line x 1 minus x 2 equal to 4. So, we get this line right uh, and then we have these variables that x 1 should and we have the bound constraint that x 1 should be greater than equal to 0, x 2 should be greater than equal to 0. Right. So, this lines we obtain right. So, this x 1 is equal to 0. So, it the region above it and x 2 should x 2 greater than 0 right. So, this this region right. So, if we look at all the constraints. So, this shaded region is actually the feasible region right. So, for linear programming uh, it can be theor it has been theoretically established that the optima always occurs at the vertex. So, the optima is either here, here here or here of this four points. So, there is no point searching at the interior points only these four points uh, have the optimal one of these four points have the optimal solution. This is our objective function line 4 x minus x 2. So, if we equate 4 x minus 4 x 1 minus x 2 as let us say minus phi some value minus phi then this is that line. So, throughout this line the objective function value is minus phi throughout this particular line the objective function value is 0 right. So, these are known as iso cost lines right. So, throughout this line z 1 z is minus phi right. So, that is an iso cost line uh, throughout this particular line uh, z is equal to 0. In this case the optima occurs at this particular point right. So, the other four points if you want you can evaluate uh, you will see that uh, the for the other four points the objective function value will work out to be 0 for this one, 16 for this one, uh, again 1 for this point for this uh, vertex and minus phi right. So, since our objective function is to minimize uh, this vertex has the uh, best possible value for uh, the objective function. Coming to integer linear programming, so in integer linear programming the decision variables are uh, scalars and integers like we can have multiple decision variable, but all of them are scalars right but all of them are scalars. So, the objective function and constraints are supposed to be linear over here. So, here we have a linear programming problem right. So, we want to minimize this function 3 x 1 plus 2 x 2 that is our objective function right and the constraints are 4 x 1 plus 2 x 2 should be greater than equal to 5, 2 x 2 is less than equal to 5, x 1 minus x 2 should be less than equal to 2. Again we convert all these constraints into equality and we can plot all these lines right. So, this is the 
uh, feasible region, right? But because of this constraint that x1 comma x2 belongs to integer variables, not real variables. So not all values of x1 and x2 are acceptable. Only the integer values of x1 and x2 are acceptable. So that's why we have. Uh, so because of that, uh, the feasible points are only these six. Right, because other points do not have integer values of x1 or x2, so only these values uh, are permissible values. Right, so it might seem that uh, the search space is smaller uh, in case of integer variables, but uh, integer programs, uh, integer programming problems are difficult to solve because we do not have the property of continuity of the decision uh, variables. So uh, most integer linear programming problems. Uh, can be solved to global optimality given sufficient time, right? Uh, but there are problems whose size is, if the number of decision variables is too large, then it is difficult to solve in reasonable time, right? But theoretically, given sufficient time, these uh, integer linear programming problems can be solved to global optimality. So the common algorithms which are used for uh, integer linear programming are branch and bound and cutting planes. So this is an example for mixed integer linear programming problems, right? In the previous slide, we saw that all the variables were integer. Over here, uh, the objective function and constraints are linear. At least one decision variable should be integer, right? And at least one decision variable should be continuous. That is why we have this uh, mixed, right? So these are the constraints. This is an example, right? So in this case, all the three variables are greater than or equal to zero, but x3 can take only integer value. So x1 and x2 can take real values, but x3 is an integer value. So this is an example of mixed integer linear programming problem. Again, mixed integer linear programming problem can be solved to global optimality given sufficient amount of time. Uh, so mixed integer linear programming problems are solved as a series of LP problems. And the algorithms that we commonly use are branch and bound and cutting planes. So nonlinear programming problems, in nonlinear programming problems, uh, either the objective function or at least one of the constraints or both are nonlinear right so the, the algorithms which are commonly used for solving nonlinear programming are for nonlinear programming are successive linear programming quadratic programming successive quadratic programming or generalized reduced gradient method right there are many other algorithms we have just listed a few of them over here right so here we have an objective function minimize f of x we have uh, m1 constraints, m1 inequality constraints. So j is equal to 1, j is equal to 2, j is equal to 3. It can go all the way up to m1, right? And we have uh, m2 equality constraints, right? So uh, we can have constraints which say 3x1 square plus x2 is equal to 5, uh, 3x3 plus uh, x4 uh, is equal to 5. So this is a nonlinear constraint, this is a linear constraint, right? So again, uh, inequalities are allowed, equalities are allowed in nonlinear programming problem. This is an example of uh, nonlinear programming problem. In fact, this is a quadratic programming problem, right? So we have, we want to maximize x1, x2 subject to the constraint that 2x1 plus 2x2 is less than equal to 16, right? So this is a linear constraint. The objective function is quadratic, right? And x1 and x2 should be uh, greater than or equal to 0. So we can again draw this line. So any line, uh, uh, any region below this is the feasible region. So this shaded part is the region. So these three lines show the value of the objective function, right? So, but for this line, since the problem is to maximize, even though z is equal to 35 is a better value than z is equal to 16, it is not in the feasible region, right? Whereas this z is equal to 16 is in the feasible region. It touches this, this point, right? So that is the optimal solution in this case, right? So again, here we are not looking into uh, how we are solving, how we are going to solve a nonlinear programming, right? Here we are just introducing it you to what is a nonlinear programming problem. So in a nonlinear programming problem, uh, global optimality is guaranteed only if the problem is convex or it has some special properties, right? So in a mixed integer nonlinear programming, either the objective function or at least one of the constraint is nonlinear. Similar to mixed integer linear programming, there is either one, at least one uh, continuous variable and one at least one discrete variable. So this is an example of an MINLP, right? So it involves two variables, x1 and x2. 
that both x1 and x2 uh, lie in the region 0 to 10, but x2 is also an uh, integer, right. So, continuous values for x2 is not uh, allowed. So, mixed integer linear programming problems can are usually solved as a series of NLP, right. For an arbitrary mixed integer linear programming, there are no algorithms which can give guarantee that the solution which has been found is globally optimal solution. So, that is why in my, uh, uh, some of the algorithms which are used to solve mixed integer linear programming are outer approximation and branch and bound. Uh, so, the other class of techniques is meta heuristic techniques, right. So, most of these techniques are uh, nature inspired, they do not require any information about the physics of the problem. So, it is more like a black box communication, right. So, in this case the problem need not be posed in uh, the conventional equality or inequality form, which was a drawback in the mathematical programming techniques, right. Here we do not have that requirement, right. So, it is suitable to solve problems uh, which are multimodal, uh, they have a large number of decision variable and continuous, uh, uh, large number of decision variable or constraints and some of the functions involved in the uh, problem are discontinuous. So, it does not give guarantee on the optimality of the solution, but usually it gives a satisfactory uh, solution especially for problems which are difficult to be solved by uh, conventional method. Over here we by conventional method we mean the mathematical programming techniques and it can also be used to solve black box uh, optimization uh, problems, right. So, in black box optimization problem you do not have a mathematical formulation, uh, but given a solution you have some kind of mechanism uh, wherein the quality of the solution can be determined. So, those are black box optimization problems. So, for black box optimization problem it is not possible to use mathematical programming techniques, uh, most of the times we rely on uh, meta heuristic techniques. Right? So, this is uh, Goldberg's view. So, Goldberg was one of the pioneer uh, who worked in uh, 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 meta heuristic techniques, right. So, these are the various types of problem, uh, unimodal problem, multimodal. So, we have seen what is unimodal problem, multimodal problem. Combinatorial problems are those which involve large number of uh, integer variables, right. So, this is problem type on the uh, x axis. Over here we have efficiency of the technique, right. So, if we employ some random scheme, right, it is going to perform poorly, right. So, this is not a very high efficiency, it is going to perform very poorly uh, on all the problems, right. Whereas, if we use specialized schemes, so for example, linear programming, simplex method, that is a specialized scheme. So, it is going to work extremely well for unimodal problems or that particular class of uh, problems, right. But over, uh, but otherwise it is going to have a uh, very poor performance. In fact, performance uh, poor than any random, random scheme. So, by random scheme we mean you give, you give an optimization problem, we let us say we randomly decide that uh, these are the values of x1, x2 and x3, the decision variables and it happens to satisfy the constraints, right. So, that is a random scheme, right. Uh, whereas, this meta heuristic techniques are known as robust scheme, right. So, it does not have a very high efficiency uh, similar to specialized scheme, uh, let us say for unimodal problems, but across a wide range of problems it can be used, right. So, that is the advantage of meta heuristic techniques. It does not give guarantee uh, even if for special category of problem, but overall it gives a satisfactory performance for most of the optimization problems, right. So, uh, our objective in this course is to have uh, a knowledge of uh, meta heuristic techniques as well as some of the specialized scheme, right. So, if we have a problem which actually falls into let us say linear programming or mixed integer linear programming, we would not choose meta heuristic techniques if we are aware of uh, the specialized schemes, right. When a meta heuristic technique is designed, it is usually tested on what is called as benchmark functions, right. So, for this benchmark functions, the optima is already known. So, given any procedure, if we want to say whether the scheme is working or not, right. So, what we will do is we will test it on these uh, benchmark functions, right. So, since the optima is already known for the benchmark functions, if the scheme is able to find the optimal solutions, then the scheme uh, or the technique is said to be a reasonably good technique, right. So, some of the benchmark functions that we will be referring in this course is uh, listed over here. So, spear function, so spear function, the objective function is uh, f is equal to x1 square plus x2 square, 
let us say for a two variable problem x1 and x2. So, this is how the objective function will behave in the search space uh, between minus 10 and 10 uh, right for uh, x1 and x2. So, this is the objective function right. So, these are called as scalable functions. So, I can also have x3 square x1 square plus x2 plus x3 square this figure is then no longer valid, but in comp, uh, but the objective function for sphere function is written like this. So, these are called as scalable function. Uh, we can make this objective function for 2 variable problem, 3 variable problem, 100 variable problem, 1000 variable problem right. So, that is what this d. So, this d determines the number of decision variables. So, that has to be fixed by uh, the user right. So, by fixing the d we can test meta heuristic techniques whether they are able to determine the optimal solution or not right. So, this is another function Rosenberg function right. So, the objective function here is as given over here right. So, here if we have a let us say two variable problem. So, the objective function is 100 x 2 minus x 1 the whole square plus x 1 minus 1 the whole square right. So, this summation does not come into picture if we have two variable, but if we had three variable then it will be this right plus 100 x 3 minus x 2 the whole square plus x 3 minus 1 the whole square x 2 minus 1 the whole square and so on. So, again by changing this d we can actually uh, have uh, objective function of multiple variables right. So, this is so, so, here if you go into this link you will be able to see all these functions right and MATLAB codes for all these functions are available. So, if you want to test a particular technique as we will do in the later half later part of the course, uh, we can uh, use these functions to test uh, the efficiency of a particular technique. So, these are some of the other uh, commonly used benchmark functions right. So, this shows the contour plots right. So, rash engine function uh, you can have a look at its objective function uh, given in the previous slide. So, x 1 and x 2 this is how the search space looks like. Remember the contour plots are lines of objective function which have the same objective function value right. So, similarly over here for this function if you see uh, all the points in this particular on this particular curve have a similar objective function right. So, the our task is to find out uh, the best value of x 1 and x 2 in this region. So, as you can see sometimes this region uh, can be really complex right. So, uh, a random scheme would not be able to find out the optimal solution in this complex uh, regions right. So, the meta heuristic techniques that we will discuss as part of this course uh, would be able to find out the globally optimal solution even with this complex functions. These are some of the functions. So, over here if we see this is the name of the function, uh, the actual function is given, d denotes the how many dimension, this is the range of the problem. So, if we have let us say 3 variable x 1, x 2, x 3, what is their domain? So, the domain here is minus 100 to 100 for all the 3 variables. Right. So, again in the later half of the course we will test uh, uh, the optimization techniques that we study on, on these problem. So, for most of this problem if you see the optima is actually 0 the objective function value is 0 except in uh, few cases. Right. So, these are the benchmark functions right. So, very often uh, the techniques are also tested on engineering problems uh, right. So, uh, right now we just want you to be aware that these problems exist right as and when required in the course we will be using them right. So, these are some of the constraint uh, problems right. So, for welded uh, beam these are the equations. So, these are already available. So, the task for the technique is to find out the optimal value such that uh, whatever that function is either minimum or maximum. For meta heuristic techniques there are standard uh, conference, uh, there are prestigious conferences. So, for example, CEC, GECO all these are names of special, uh, all these are names of uh, reputed conferences. So, every year uh, when these conferences are conducted they have competition. So, they give out problems uh, not the benchmark functions which you saw previously. Uh, there are some drawbacks with the benchmark functions which you have seen previously. We will discuss it later right. But uh, these every year uh, as part of these conferences these uh, benchmark functions are given to the user. So, a user is supposed to design techniques 
uh, and demonstrate its performance on these problems. These are available for most of the programming languages like uh, C, MATLAB, uh, the functions are already available. You, can, uh, you don't need to code the objective function as such, uh, you just need to evaluate uh, whatever technique you have proposed on these functions. So this is some of the recent literature, right? So meta heuristic uh, techniques are uh, a hot area of research, right? So all these are papers which are published in 2019-20, right? So all this is 2020. So this is again a new algorithm, new meta heuristic algorithm. So bio inspired, right? Uh, the name of the algorithm is Manta Ray Forging Optimization. This is social mimic optimization algorithm. This is squirrel search algorithm. Uh, this is based on uh, squirrel search algorithm, right? And then there are uh, uh, algorithms which are modified uh, often, right? So, for example, BAT algorithm already exists. So, this paper proposes a hybridizing uh, BAT algorithm with differential evolution. So, we will be looking into differential evolution as part of this course. Right. So, we will be looking into teaching learning based optimization. Right. So, over here in this work, uh, they have uh, hybridized it with a neural network for engineering design of uh, optimization problem. Um, he, these are couple of examples for newly proposed multi-objective optimization. So, for example, here if you see it is a multi-objective artificial sheep algorithm. So, this algorithm has been probably designed based on the behavior of uh, sheep. Right. Uh, here again we have multi objective firefly algorithm so you might know about fireflies right so depending upon their behavior this multi objective algorithm has been designed so the point that i am trying to reinforce is once you learn this four or five uh, uh, once we learn few of the meta heuristic techniques you will be in a position to actually understand many of this papers right and critically critically review uh, this work and also and also possibly propose your own algorithm. So these are some of the classical uh, optimization books, right? So this uh, book particularly uh, helps in developing models, right? So we'll be touching upon developing models in this course, uh, but greater details are available in this book, Model Building in for Mathematical Programming. Uh, this is a classical book by Taha, Operation Research. Uh, this is again a standard textbook for engineering optimization by S. S. Rao. Uh, this one is by uh, Reclatis and co-workers. Right? So this is Goldberg's book on uh, genetic algorithm, uh, differential evolution uh, by Price and Stone. Right? And this is another classical uh, book by Kalyan Maidev. Right? And we also have this uh, optimization of chemical processes. So uh, since this course has also been listed under uh, chemical engineering. Uh, those of you who are chemical engineers can actually look into this book wherein you have examples from uh, chemical engineering. Again, uh, whatever we are going to discuss as part of this course uh, does not necessarily borrow any concepts from any particular engineering field. Right? Whatever we are discussing is going to be very generic. You can apply it to your own area. With that, we will be concluding this session. In this session, we have seen components of optimization problem classification of optimization problems as well as classification of optimization techniques. Then we looked into multi-objective optimization, right? In this course, we are not going to see how to solve a multi-objective optimization problem, but at least broadly you know the difference between single objective optimization and multi-objective optimization. We followed this up with how to solve a single and multivariable optimization problem in the absence of constraints, right? So after that, we looked into meta heuristic techniques, right? So we just give you a a brief introduction to meta heuristic techniques and the major portion of this course is going to be on uh, meta heuristic techniques. Right? So the next session is going to be on uh, linear regression. Right? So the linear regression we have divided into three sessions. Right? So first we will be looking at uh, linear regression, simple linear reg regression. Then we will be extending that to solve polynomial regression problem and multilinear regression problem. And we will also look into general linear least squares. Right? So the final session would be on how to use the inbuilt function of MATLAB to solve linear and nonlinear regression problems. So for those of you who are not interested in learning MATLAB, you can skip that particular session. Right? So the quiz and assignment will not have anything from that particular uh, implementation session. Right? So with that, we conclude this session. Thank you.